welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God. This two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Monday, June 10th, we are studying Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 1 through chapter 7, verse 4. In today's text, the growing opposition from outside enemies toward Nehemiah's leadership does not succeed, and the people complete the walls of Jerusalem with the help of God. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us Pastor James Helms, Jr. Pastor Helms serves at Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Greenbelt, Maryland. Pastor Helms, welcome to Sharper Iron. It's great to be here. Thank you. It's a joy to have you with us today. Give us some context as we get started. What should we know about Nehemiah and everything that's been leading up to our text in chapters 6 and 7 this morning? So, yeah, we're in chapter 6, a little bit of 7. Nehemiah has been working to rebuild the walls, and along with the returning exiles to the land of Judah. And uh, the book itself, I, I when I think of Nehemiah, I know a lot of people don't like to think of books in this context, but I think of it as it's a book of leadership. That's how it's always been spoken of to me. And like this, Ezra, Daniel... When I'm trying to think, how do I lead people and live in this world? Those are the kind of books I go to to say, what did they do to lead their people? And that's what I love about Nehemiah. Hmm. We've seen that in other texts, and I think we'll see it in today's as well, that Nehemiah does provide a good example of Christian leadership. Certainly that's not the only thing that is in the book, but it is something that we we should be able to draw from that. And what I appreciate, especially about the, the three men that you mentioned in that same regard, not only Nehemiah, but also Ezra and Daniel, they lead the people during times of, of exile or return from exile when there's great opposition. Mm-hmm. And in that sense, I, I find all three of these books, which actually we've been reading consecutively here on Sharper Iron, Daniel, Ezra, now Nehemiah, I find these books very helpful not only for those who would be leaders of Christians, but just Christians in general, as ways to live faithfully when the world around us is not always terribly friendly to us. Yes, you hear, uh, so I live just outside of the the D.C. border. You hear the book of Daniel a lot on the radio because you got lots of Christians here who work Mm -hmm. for the federal government, and they work for other agencies who may not be friendly to our beliefs, and they all want to know, how do we live in this world that we stay true to our faith? Yeah, that's right. And Daniel, I think it gets a lot more, he's a little more popular of a book these days when it comes to those things, but Ezra and Nehemiah, which maybe we don't read quite as much in our age, have a lot to say about that. And we're going to see how Nehemiah handles some of the opposition that comes against him in chapter 6. He's been facing this opposition, especially from outside the community, We Mm -hmm. saw how opposition arose inside the community in chapter 5, at least in the sense of sin that was starting to divide the group. That's been handled, that's been dealt with, but the opposition outside the community from some of the outside leaders continues. It grows here, but Nehemiah handles it very faithfully, and the Lord provides success. So here is the text. We're in Nehemiah chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Now when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left in it, although up to that time I had not set up the doors in the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent to me, saying, Come and let us meet together at Hakafarim in the plain of Ono. But they intended to do me harm, and I sent messengers to them, saying, I am doing a great work, and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? And they sent to me four times in this way, and I answered them in the same manner. In the same way, Sanballat, for the fifth time, sent his servant to me with an open letter in his hand. In it was written, It is reported among the nations, and Geshem also says it, that you and the Jews intend to rebel. That is why you are building the wall. And according to these reports, you wish to become their king. And you have also set up prophets to proclaim you, sorry, to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem, 
There is a king in Judah, and now the king will hear of these reports. So now come, and let us take counsel together. Then I sent to him, saying, No such things as you say have been done, for you are inventing them out of your own mind. For they all wanted to frighten us, thinking, Their hands will drop from the work, and it will not be done. But now, O God, strengthen my hands. Now, when I went into the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, son of Mehetabel, who was confined to his home, he said, Let us meet together in the house of God, within the temple. Let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. They are coming to kill you by night. But I said, Should such a man as I run away? And what man such as I could go into the temple and live? I will not go in. And I understood and saw that God had not sent him, but he had pronounced the prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. For this purpose he was hired, that I should be afraid and act in this way and sin, and so they could give me a bad name in order to taunt me. Remember Tobiah and Sanballat, O my God, according to these things that they did, and also the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid. So the wall was finished on the twenty-fifth day of the month of Elul in fifty-two days. And when all our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid and fell greatly in their own esteem, for they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. Moreover, in those days the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah, and Tobiah's letters came to them. For many in Judah were bound by oath to him, because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah the son of Arah, and his son Jehohanan had taken the daughter of Meshalam the son of Berechiah as his wife. Also they spoke of his good deeds in my presence, and reported my words to him, and Tobiah sent letters to make me afraid. Now when the wall had been built, and I had set up the doors, and the gatekeepers, the singers, and the Levites had been appointed, I gave my brother Hanani and Hananiah, the governor of the castle, charge over Jerusalem, for he was a more faithful and God-fearing man than many. And I said to them, Let not the gates of Jerusalem be opened until the sun is hot. And while they are still standing guard, let them shut and bar the doors. Appoint guards from among the inhabitants of Jerusalem, some at their guard posts and some in front of their own homes. The city was wide and large, but the people within it were few, and no houses had been rebuilt. That is our text for today, Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 1 through chapter 7, verse 4. Pastor Helms, uh, take us into the opening couple of verses We've got Sambalot, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, the enemies come back again with opposition against Nehemiah, and we've got a different tactic this time. Help us into these first couple verses. What's going on? So what I actually notice here is there seems to be an escalation. So first they're just sending a couple letters because they want to get them to come out to them to delay the work as best they can, and if they can, you know, do him harm, maybe even an assassination just to get the the construction to stop because they know if he's not there to lead it, it's probably not going to happen. And then they have this open letter, which, you know, uh, comment on the, on the idea of an open letter in a bit here. And then eventually they even get false prophets going and they're trying to get him to go into the temple so they can, you know, say things about, Oh, he went into the temple to a place he's not supposed to go. This escalation as they get closer and closer to completing the wall, and it makes me think of the revelation to St. John. You see these three sets of seven. You know, as Satan's time gets closer to the end, or as we get closer to the end and Satan knows what's coming, his tantrum just gets worse and worse and worse as the world grows worse. And you know, that, that just seems to be how the kingdom of darkness works. As its end draws closer it just throws a fit bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's kind of what I thought of when I saw this. But we have those outside of the people trying to build it, trying to stop it because they know if this is constructed, if it's completed, our influence in the area is going to grow weak and they don't want to see any of that happen. Yeah, so just within the large narrative of these chapter 6 and the first part of chapter 7, we see that pattern that repeats itself really throughout history, that as God works within the world to bring about his purposes, especially his purpose of salvation for his people, 
the powers of darkness fight against him. And the closer that he gets to his goal, the harder they fight. Uh, you know, you mentioned the book of Revelation as one example of that. Within that book, I, I think of chapter 12, where Satan, the great dragon, is thrown down. And I can't quote it exactly, but but St. John says, look out, because he knows that his time is short. And mm-hmm. so he attacks with great wrath. And so certainly we as the church experience that today. I think you see that same pattern show up in, in our in the ministry of our Lord when you think about his his time with his disciples and as how as he gets closer and closer to Jerusalem, the opposition grows and grows and grows and it really reaches that climax during Holy Week. So that yeah, this is just the the pattern that continues throughout history until our Lord Jesus comes again. Now the good news for, for readers of Scripture and, and for the Church today, is that we know how the book ends, and that's that's yeah. Revelation. Jesus wins. <laughs> yes, yep. and maybe maybe that's why the tantrum just keeps getting bigger and bigger because he's mad. He knows he's going to lose. He doesn't like it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so there's I mean there's kind of the the shape of the text as a whole. We see the enmity against the Lord and His people grow and grow and grow, and yet the Lord gives success to His people. Although, notice, yes. again, where we are in history at this point, that doesn't stop the opposition at this point, because, you know, we're not at the end, capital E. And right. so the opposition does continue even after the walls are are complete. But you see that larger shape of the narrative. So let's talk a little bit about the opposition that comes then at the beginning and see how it grows. It starts with these letters that come to Nehemiah. The first four are typical correspondence for a letter. We'll, we'll get to the fifth, which is that open letter after that. Let's, let's just talk about these first four. You know, we get to hear about this sort of from the, the 30,000 foot view, and we know what's going on. It seems like Nehemiah knows what's going on in the midst of it, or at least that's how he, he records it here as he's telling us about it after the fact. Uh, talk to us about these these letters and, and maybe how Nehemiah realizes kind of what's going on in the background as to what looks like a, a you know, it's like a nice request, but Nehemiah really knows they're out to get him. Yeah, so Nehemiah is no fool, and he knows, uh, so Sanballat, I believe he was a governor in Samaria, uh, Tobiah, this was a man who had lots of political connections within the people. These These were guys who would have opposed the construction and especially any walls, temples. They don't like that because they want to keep their influence in the area. And they're probably, they know that the king has supported this effort and they don't want, they want to maintain their influence on the area. They don't, they, you know, they're, they're coveting their power, their influence, probably their money. And they just they just know that if God's people are able to construct this, it will we can. And I can't remember it started with a G. Remember there the fall that false temple in Samaria. They want worship to be there. They want it to be under them, not for it to be centered in Jerusalem where it's supposed to be. Sure. They don't want yeah, it to be uh, in Judah. Mount again. Gerizim, maybe is yes. what you're thinking about. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so these, they send these letters and they're trying to draw him away to, I'm going to pronounce all these wrong. Just go for it. <laughs> oh no, that one's pretty easy. Oh no. And so he wants to draw him aw- to there. That's pretty far away from Jerusalem. I, I have a note here. It's like 25 to 30 miles away from Jerusalem. Yeah. I'm not exactly sure how far away, but he's trying to isolate him because if he can isolate him, then they can do whatever. But even if they can't do that, maybe just the letters themselves will intimidate him. Um, it makes me think of, you know, the, <laughs> the, the trick I heard from a lawyer once is the best way to win is to threaten a lawsuit without using the word lawsuit. Mm. Just kind of put the idea in their head because then you let their imaginations run wild and they'll think the worst case scenario without you having to spell it out. And whatever they think of will be more scary to them than anything you said i think that's why the first couple letters aren't specific they're just trying to intimidate you know threaten lawsuit without the word lawsuit Mm. hey you got to be careful here and then maybe he'll get scared it maybe even slow down and give them more time which yeah and i think i and i think that that matter of slowing down and delaying is is definitely 
in within the letters, and it's something that Nehemiah recognizes. If nothing else, he knows that if he makes this 25, 30-mile journey to where they want to meet him, and I mean, you know, we're not talking about r- driving cars and getting there in 30 minutes. We're talking about using, what, three days probably for this whole whole trip, uh, depending on how fast he walks or if he, what he rides. I know we, we know he rides earlier in the book on a mount around Jerusalem, but he's going to use up a bunch of his time if he goes to make the, the journey. And so just the delay in the work, uh, you see Nehemiah's focus on what God has given him to do, in addition to the wisdom of recognizing that this is not a friendly request, it is, it is given out of enmity. I think you can also in, infer from other parts of the text that there are probably already enemies seated in the area. So yeah. I'm sure Nehemiah is thinking, if I disappear for that long, let's say it's only a week, if I'm gone for a week, what's going to happen while I'm not here? Because this is a precarious place in the history of the people. He knows strong leadership is necessary here and now. Yeah. Yeah, I think, and this is like this isn't the first time we've met these three men: Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, as you pointed out. And Nehemiah knows that they've been opposed to him thus far, and even though perhaps at, on the surface reading of those first four letters it looks friendly enough, he has that wisdom to recognize what's really behind it. And I think there's something to that for us as Christians. Again, when it comes to wisdom, to be sure, the word of the Lord converts people and converts enemies to saints. And, and we should never doubt the power of the word to convert people. At the same time, there is a, a wisdom in recognizing the plans and plots of our enemies and being prepared to respond to them faithfully toward the Lord rather than in, oh, foolishness, I guess. Yeah, I can almost imagine... It doesn't, it doesn't say it in here, but I wonder if Nehemiah at some point didn't just imply to them, you know, why don't you come talk to me? <laughs> yeah. I'm busy. Come talk to me here, which, of yeah. course, they don't do, and they won't because that's, that's not what they want. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So this happens four times. Uh, verse 4 says, they sent to me four times in this way. Every time Nehemiah answers the same way, I'm doing a great work. I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? So then, verse 5, we find out about a fifth time that comes. Sambalot sends uh, his servant with, and this time it's an open letter in his <laughs> hand. And we've got different different language here. It's not just, come meet me, but now there's some some accusations made. And again, it's an open letter. So we, we got this, here comes the escalation you're talking about. So help us to see what's going on as the, the conflict escalates in verses 5 and following. The idea of an open letter, I just find hilarious because we hear open about open letters on the internet all the time. You know, open letter to President Biden or open letter to Senator, I don't know, anybody. And open letter to, I don't know, Bill Gates, someone famous. But the letter's never really addressed to the person they say it's addressed to. That's right. The, an open letter is never intended to inform the person they address it to. An open letter is always intended to manipulate the thoughts of those who are reading it to, uh, what's, what's the word? Um, not impact. Influence the yeah. actions of the person's it, or person or persons it's addressed to. It's because they want to get what they want and they're trying to influence public opinion. Because otherwise, why would it be an open letter? What do sure. you care if everybody's reading it? Yeah, and an open letter, you know, when we hear open letter today, I think we, you know, we do hear like something that gets posted publicly on social media or for, for anyone to read. And that's that's what's going on here with the open letter. I mean, in this case, it very really means it's not sealed. You, mm-hmm. you would have had the wax seal on it. This is literally an open letter that anyone could read, which means, I mean, we're talking about things like gossip, again, influence, persuasion, I mean, all, and, and all the negative connotations of those words. That's what's going on with the open letter. So this is a, maybe intimidation is a, a part yeah. of this even more. It's like, this isn't just a letter to you, Nehemiah. This is an open letter that we're letting anyone and everyone read that the intimidate, intimidation factor is growing here with that. You know, what just, just came to mind is when Babylon was on the doorsteps of 
the castle walls and they have the emissary shouting in Hebrew and they're like, no, speak to us in a different language because we understand this. And he's like, am I talking to you? Am I talking to the people on the wall? Because their goal was to make everyone afraid. Yeah. I, right. That's all. I, when I look at this and I hear open letter, that's what comes to my mind. Is this is the goal is not the goal is to make everyone else afraid. So Nehemiah has less support. Yeah, that's that's it. It's this isn't only Nehemiah now that's being attacked. This is also all the people that Nehemiah is leading. Kind of again that intimidation, not only of Nehemiah but of the whole group. Okay, this is what Nehemiah is up to, and this are, these are the consequences for all the people if you continue to follow his leadership, again, it's the opposition growing, all just simply from the fact that it's an open letter that gets delivered on this fifth time. Now, let's talk a little bit about what's actually in that letter, some of the accusations. It's not just say, hey, come and meet us, but it's saying, here's what's being said about you, mm-hmm. Nehemiah, and your whole group. Talk to us about the accusations that we, we read about starting in verse 6. Well, first and foremost, we know the accusations are all false. This is stuff that they have just made up because they're trying to say, and, and they're saying, oh, people are saying this, this is, this is getting around. Uh, it made me think of, you know, sometimes as pastors, we'll have someone come to us and they'll say, pastor, people have been saying to me, and I've heard, and, and a bunch of people have been confiding in me this or this or such and such. And you have to wonder, okay, so how many people are actually saying this to you? Sure. And why aren't they saying it to me? And why are so many people putting so much faith into you that they want to bring? Is it, Maybe this is actually just coming from you. Mm. And and that, so I'm sure Nehemiah picks this up immediately. He knows this is nonsense. Nobody's actually saying this. This, this is coming from the minds of the people who wrote the letter. They're saying he, oh, he, he's trying to make himself a king in opposition to the the king who sent him and he's trying to build the wall so he can rebel and and he's like no none none of this is true we're not trying to rebel against the empire we're just trying to rebuild the walls of the city because this is what god has sent me to do god didn't send me to be an open rebellion he sent me to rebuild the walls yeah so let's talk a little bit about the the response just at large to that Nehemiah gives, which, you know, as you said, he's responding here to false accusations. The things that are in this letter are not true. Maybe as we think about that in, in our own lives as Christians, it's not always false accusations that come against us in sort of an in, in intimidating way, at least officially like this, but maybe this has something to say to the way we would respond to God gossip or to rumors mm-hmm. or to things that as we hear them, we recognize their falsehood. Uh, talk a little bit about the way that, that Nehemiah's response can guide us as Christians as we think about how do we respond to false accusations and, and rumors and gossip. Again, maybe not a, in a, as an official capacity, but more informally sometimes. I think he doesn't say it directly, but I think it's kind of inferred in how we respond. He's asking them, as they say today, he's asking them for the receipts. <laughs> he says, no such things as you say have been done, for they are inventing them. You are you are inventing them out of your own mind. Nobody else is saying this. Yeah. You're the one saying this. You're just making this up. So you know what? Bring, it's kind of inferred, you know, bring some more evidence here. Actually show that what you're saying is actually happening because it's not, and I know because I'm here and it's, it's not happening. So, you know, show me some evidence. This is, this is all just gossip. This is all hearsay. And you guys know it. You yeah. know you're just making this up. Right. And so he doesn't let it get him down. It doesn't let it bother him. And, you know, like I said, sometimes people will come and say, oh, well, I hear a bunch of people saying this. And my response is always, well, until these people actually come and speak to me, I'm, I'm going to treat it as such. This is one person who has made a concern, not 10 people who have made a concern. Uh, this is, it, and you got to be careful about that anytime you're in a position of leadership because, you know, it's it's always so much easier to go to other people and say blah, blah, blah about the person and rather than come and actually confront him and say, here's the evidence, can you please address this? And yeah, so he's, yeah. he's, he's not even entertaining the fact that they've said all of this. He's straight up, you're lying. This is all made up. Yeah, that's right. Nehemiah's response is much more direct than what is being thrown at him. 
they're kind of going into round passive aggressive sort of mm-hmm. moves to intimidate him and the people and Nehemiah always responds very directly. We saw that same direct response from Nehemiah previously in the book, and it continues here, which is certainly a good good wisdom for Christian leaders that when gossip comes up, it is good to respond directly to those involved to try to be in conversation with the people themselves. And I think for anyone, yeah. then, as a Christian, when we encounter gossip, rumors, falsehood, to always seek for the truth and to be very direct and upfront about confronting falsehood. Like, no, no I'm not going to, yeah. I'm not going to entertain this. I'm just going to look for the truth and be very direct about it. My mentor, wise man, he said to me when I was working through an issue early on, he said to me, darkness hates light. If you've got a problem, shed as much light on it as you can. And I found that once I just called everyone to the table who was involved, all right, let's all sit at the table and let's 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 go through this. And okay, so what's actually going on? Suddenly, those who were saying the thing kind of backed off, and that's what happens. You you shed as much light as you can on it, and all of a sudden, those who don't have the receipts, they they don't have any evidence, they they'll just back off because they can't prove anything. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, so we get a lot of good biblical wisdom here from Nehemiah, putting the faith into practice. We're going to keep looking at this text more on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron on KFUO. Talking to Pastor James Helms Jr. this morning. We will be right back. Please stick around. Lutheran Church Extension Fund exists to support Lutheran Church Missouri Synod Ministries and church workers. How do we do this? Your investment with LCEF makes it possible for LCMS churches, schools, organizations, and church workers to receive low-cost loans for new and growing ministries. And faithful Lutherans like you, church members and church workers alike, make that possible when you invest with LCEF. Learn more at lcef.org. LCF is a nonprofit religious organization. Therefore, LCF investments are not FDIC insured bank deposit accounts. This is not an offer to sell investments or solicitation to buy. LCF will offer and sell its securities only in states where authorized. The offer is made solely by LCF's offering circular. Investors should carefully read the offering circular, which more fully describes associated risks. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Monday, June 10th. We're studying Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 1 through chapter 7, verse 4 with Pastor James Helms, Jr. He serves at Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Greenbelt, Maryland. Pastor Helms, prior to the break, we were talking about this open letter that gets sent to Nehemiah, and we talked about Nehemiah's response. I think within the accusations that are in there, within the letter itself, there's a few telling details. One thing that stands out to me is that these accusations all have to do with you, Nehemiah, and the people who are rebuilding Jerusalem, you are rebels against the king of Persia. You're trying to, to follow a different king. And, and while, as you noted, these are false accusations and Nehemiah just denies them outright, I think there is something telling about that accusation that maybe gives us a sense of what the faith of these people is, that although they're not rebelling against the king of Persia, They do recognize that the king of Persia is not the king, but that the Lord himself is king. Talk a little bit. Let's let's have that conversation. Okay. Well, rebellion is should always be a precarious word to any Christian because we have the command, obey your leaders, obey your rulers. And that was said by the Apostle Paul in a time when, you know, they were burning Christians at the stake just for being Christians. So we should take that seriously when he says give honor to honor that that sorry some honor to though those whom honor is owed uh i just i was at a homeschool convention this past weekend and i was debating with someone trying to tell them no the bible says pay your taxes <laughs> so i just had this conversation no bible says pay your taxes pay your taxes to whom they are owed uh sometimes though it can appear when we're doing what the lord has called us to do that we are in open rebellion, especially when our theology and our teachings are in direct contradiction to 
those in authority over us. And when that happens, we always have to side with what the Lord has told us. But again, sometimes it looks like we are in open rebellion. And so, you know, a Christian could be working in, you know, as lo local idea here, federal government, which doesn't always do super Christian things. And as a Christian, we have to confess what you're doing is wrong. But sometimes people could take that outspokenness as an act of rebellion. And that's especially in an area where a lot of the people that I work with, their jobs depend on something that we call a secret clearance. And they're always wondering, if I speak too loud about this, am I going to lose my secret clearance and therefore lose my job yeah. because I confess what the Bible says? Mm. And so I expect that's probably part of the accusation. He's just doing what the Lord has called him to do, which is rebuild the wall. And his enemies are saying, hey, you're rebuilding the wall so you can follow in the footsteps of the kings that came before and rebel against the empire. And he said, no, 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 I am a faithful servant of the empire. I'm just doing what God told me to do. Right, right. Yeah, I think, I mean, you think about the, the confession of the New Testament, Jesus is Lord, which stands in opposition to the confession of the Roman pagans around them, Caesar is Lord. There's mm -hmm. always going to be that kind of tension that Christians live in, because the confession Jesus is Lord is primary. Within that confession Jesus is Lord, there is a respect, obedience to authority, as you said, but the confession Jesus is Lord is over all of it. It is to, when we give to the Lord what is due above all else. And so, you know, there are going to constantly be these accusations against Christians, which, I mean, when the Apostle tells pastors especially to live above reproach, or when St. Peter talks about not suffering for doing what is evil, you know, we, we should live as Christians as those who, they may make the charge, but it doesn't stick, like Nehemiah is doing here. But that accusation is going to come because we do confess that there is only one king, the Lord Jesus Christ. It seems that they're confessing the same thing here in the background. It mentions, you know, the, the accusation comes, you've got these prophets who are, who are, you know, calling for a different king in Jerusalem, while the king in Persia, you know, he's over there. What are you guys doing? It kind of makes you, again, at least makes me wonder, like, what prophets are they reading? You know, we're about, what, 450, 440s BC here. And the prophets have mostly ceased to speak at this point. I think Malachi is usually dated right around 450 BC. Zechariah, who came before, talks a lot about the kingdom. Obviously, the kingdom of God is a, a, a big theme in the scriptures. So you kind of wonder, what, what prophets are they reading? What's their faith? I, I'd like to sense that in the yeah. background, there is a hope among these Judean exiles who have returned that the Lord is king, and the enemies are trying to pick up on that and spin it to make this cause of rebellion. And of course, I mean, you can think forward. We talked about the patterns that get set. Think forward to our Lord's own trial, the accusation against him, are you the king of the Jews? And then finally, when the, the religious leaders play their trump card, they say, we have no king but Caesar. You know, I mean, you, you see how these patterns play themselves out again, even today, as you're pointing out. I also uh, think back to as they were going into exile and before they went into exile, what did the prophets say? You're going to be there a while. So seek the good of the empire. Sure. Seek the good of those who are taking you into exile, because if they prosper, you will prosper. I, as, this is something I, I teach in Bible study. Even if he, he, you know, he's your president, this whole not my president stuff that happened you know, first they did it for Trump, then they did it for Biden. So it seems like everybody doesn't have a president in the line. Uh, it's not my, well, no, he's your president because he was duly elected. And even if you think he's the worst thing in the world, you want him to succeed because if he succeeds, then the nation can succeed. Now, succeed might not mean that he gets what he wants. Right. Because sometimes what the president wants is not exactly good, but nonetheless, you want him to succeed in general for your sake. You want the government to succeed in general for your sake. You want it to prosper because then your community will prosper. And so even a pagan tyrant, God can use 
for your good. I say, you know, I, I think it was Ben Franklin who said this, a rule of tyrant is better than rule by mob. Because at least the tyrant, you have you know what to expect. With the mob, you never know what to expect. Yeah, so we have some, some wisdom here again for living under civil government that Christians do confess. Jesus is Lord, Jesus is King, but also seek within that confession to live faithfully under the rulers God has given. Certainly lots of tension within that life, but by God's grace, we continue on. Now, there's a, a little note here. So we've got that open letter. Nehemiah has said, nope, not having anything to do with this. He recognizes that they're just trying to frighten and intimidate. Before we move on, there's just this wonderful little prayer at the end of verse 9. Nehemiah has a habit of putting these little prayers within the text, and it's just marvelous. He says, but now, O God, strengthen my hands. Uh, and we see other prayers a, a few verses later. Talk to us a little bit about the the prayer in the midst of all <laughs> what's going on. It's... It's so real to me. It's so relatable because, you know, I've had parishioners come to me and they say, oh, pastor, I want to be able to pray about this. I want to be able to pray about that. What should I say? And I think sometimes they expect this big, lengthy prayer. And sometimes the answer is just, well, just pray the Lord's Prayer because then it's a catch-all for everything. But, <laughs> but also sometimes my response is, Lord, please help me is a valid prayer. Like You don't have to go on forever yeah. and ever. Uh, you don't have to ramble on as the pagans do. You have here, perfectly. He knows that God knows the struggles he's going through. Yep. He knows in the midst of all of this, all, in the face of his adversaries, he knows that the Lord favors the work that he is doing, and he knows that the Lord knows everything he needs. So all he says is, oh God, strengthen my hands because he knows that's what he needs he needs the lord the strength in his hands and give him um what's the word to 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 guide him in the way and then he just trusts the lord to do it yeah yeah i mean just the very simple prayer strengthen my hands lord have mercy god be praised these very yes. short prayers the scriptures give to us our appropriate responses as we go throughout our day, just a simple Christian reflex to whatever we face, we pray. And Nehemiah does that beautifully. So the, the conflict has escalated. You've got the sealed letters saying, come on, visit us, Nehemiah. The open letter, more intimidation. Now we see how the intimidation and opposition continues to escalate as it gets even into the community itself. So Nehemiah visits someone there in Israel, Shemaiah. We find out a little bit about his lineage. He's confined to his home. There's an invitation. Hey, let's go meet in the temple because they're trying to kill you. And this, again, sounds reasonable enough, but Nehemiah knows what's going on here, really, and he absolutely refuses. Uh, why is this such a—I mean, why does, why does Nehemiah absolutely refuse to go into the temple at the invitation of this man? Because in my best general Akbar voice, that's a trap. <laughs> That's good. That's right. It he is knows. a trap. He is, he's trying to cause him to do something he ought not to do because they have already figured out it's kind of it, it's just just like they tried to trap Jesus. They knew that Jesus was doing all the right stuff, so they tried to trick Jesus into saying the wrong thing even if he didn't mean the wrong thing so they mm. could take him. Uh, we see that today, our, the enemies of the church, they try to trick us into saying the wrong thing, even if we aren't doing the wrong thing here. He's trying to trick him to go somewhere he's not supposed to be. We know in the temple, without getting to all the specifics of it, we know that the temple had different rooms and different areas, and it was the same thing with the tabernacle. You had different rooms and different areas, and depending on who you were, you went to certain places. And then you had the Holy of Holies, which... Only the high priest went into and but once a year and after making sacrifice. So he's trying to trick him to go somewhere he's not supposed to be so that accusations could be made against him. Or maybe even they might be thinking, maybe if we convince him to go somewhere he's not supposed to be, maybe we can make God angry with him. Mm. And then he'll lose the favor of the Lord. I can't help but wonder if they're thinking, hey, if we do that, then maybe God will stop favoring him. And they they know that... Though it says later on how quickly it went, they know that this work is being favored by God. And so if maybe we can take that favor away, the work will cease, or at least, again, slow down. Yeah. 
Yeah, and it, it is striking to see how as the opposition escalates, now it's coming from within the community of the returned exiles. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we've we've seen it come from outside. Sambalot, Tobiah, Geshem have all been pushing harder. Now it's almost like they've got a, a mole planted among the people. It seems that <laughs> maybe they're they're behind they are behind this. And and they find that that help from within. Again, see how these things play out within the the narrative of the scriptures, God's work through history. You have, you know, the betrayer from within the twelve. You have I mean warnings from Paul, Peter, John, all the apostles in the New Testament. Watch out for false prophets who will arise among you. So it I mean, as, as Christians, again, we need to be wise against the opposition that comes from the world. We also need to be wise against the opposition that may arise from within the church and the way that the devil tempts even in the community of the church. This We see Nehemiah dealing with it from all sides here. Okay. Before I go on too much further, I have before I make the Star Wars fandom mad at me, I have to correct myself. It's Gen- Admiral Akbar, not General Akbar. I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> that was going to bother me all day. Not really. But I just, thank I you. just thought of that. As, oh, no, I said the wrong thing. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, it does start coming from within, and uh, we see that. Let's see, where was it? it said uh, he. Oh, where was it? Do we? I lost my place in here. But uh, he's got ties to everyone. Lots of people owe allegiance to him. Which verse oh, was the this? you mean Geshem the or Tobiah? Yeah. Yes, so it's verse these... seven. We haven't really gotten there as, as we've been going going verse by verse, oh, but sorry, verses. I'm skipping no, it's okay. that's okay. Yeah, <laughs> we we do find out that Tobiah's letters ha- had influenced a lot of people. That's in verses seventeen and, and following. Yeah, so these aren't. I mean, these aren't small people that we're talking about. Tobiah no, and, and well so connected. forth from the outside. Yeah, and they've made inroads within the community such that now the opposition's coming from inside as well. Mm-hmm. And everybody owes allegiance through be it business or marriage. And it makes me think of the Proverbs, how it says, be careful that you don't strike hands too easily with too many people, be, you know, which allegiance is you give to whom. And um, honestly, what that makes me think of is just, you know, do you strike, how many times do you strike hands with people outside your community versus those within? Do you need a plumber to, for your church? Are you going to hire the plumber who's a Lutheran, who's right in your congregation, or are you going to hire the guy outside the church because it's cheaper or it's easier? You know, be careful who you strike hands with. Be, I know I think of like Amazon controls what percentage of book sales worldwide, and I know uh, Lutheran Public Radio had an interview with a guy who was trying to sell a book on there. I need a chapter on transgenderism. And they said, the publisher said, you have to delete that chapter because Amazon won't sell it. Mm. And that's why we have our own publishing house. So we don't have to strike hands with those outside of the community. And we can do this all in-house. I know there's this big controversy about a book that was published a little while ago from CVH. But you know what? It's good that we have it because... If we can keep everything in house, then we can say, well, we don't have to depend on those outside. We don't have to worry about those outside influences. Yeah, yeah. Th- that note about again the the inroads that Tobiah has made kind of comes after the completion of the temple. But that is a, an important thing to note here. L- look out for again. Show that wisdom that Nehemiah has to recognize the attacks when they're coming, rather than the the naivete. That would say, oh, you know, these people mean me well. They don't actually mean you well. And again, no. it, we need to be wise as serpents, as the Lord teaches his disciples when he sends them out, when we deal within the world, so that we don't fall into these traps that the world would set. And then again, such that the opposition would come from within the community. Uh, we need to be wise to both the, the false prophets within and those who come from without. So yeah. Nehemiah has been dealing with all of this. He's, he's now got to, to deny Shemaiah and his request to come to the temple, and he does so faithfully. You get another prayer in verse 14, which is maybe a little bit different than some of the others. He says, remember Tobiah and Sanballat, according to these things that they did. So the so Lord, don't forget what's go- gone on, which... And, and also he mentions a, a couple of false prophets and false and a false prophetess, Noadiah, uh, who also the Lord should remember, which maybe strikes us as like, oh, I don't know if I can pray like that. 
But really, what what Nehemiah is, he's not praying in vengeance. He's actually asking the Lord to be the one to bring about justice and refuses to take it himself. I love this prayer. I think of the prayers of Nehemiah all the time, how simple and direct and also open-ended. He's not trying to control the Lord and say, do it this way, God, oh, please. He says, God, here's my concern. You deal with it however you're going to deal with it. Is he, he says, God, remember what they did. And then he just leaves it up to God. And you can, you can probably imagine the Apostle Paul, lots of people were praying, oh, God, deal with Paul. Well, God dealt with Paul by yeah. making him a Christian. That's right. <laughs> So, you know, mercy and vengeance are, they belong to the Lord. It's, it's not for who, who am I? You know, I'm, I'm just a servant and this is a fellow servant, maybe not a good servant, but as a fellow servant of the Lord. And it's up to him. It's not, it's not on me unless, you know, within church polity, you know, we have our structure in place and then we got to discipline people sometimes within that church structure and polity. But other than that, if it's just, if it's a beef between one guy and another, you know what? Let the Lord handle it. Give it to God and let him deal with it. And he'll deal with it in his own time, however he deals with it. Sure, yeah. I and mean, this is Nehemiah. We've seen him do this elsewhere with his prayers. He has responded faithfully according to what God has given, and then he prays that the Lord would bless that. So so Nehemiah has dealt faithfully with the opposition that's come and says, Lord, you remember what's gone on. You deal with that opposition in your way, at your time. I've responded faithfully according to your word. Now bless what you have what you have done. Continue to and remember these people. Bring your justice. This is your work, not mine, says Nehemiah in his prayer to the Lord. Now that brings us then to a bit of a climax within the book. You get in verse 15, although it's it's maybe it kind of is like, well, that's that's that. The wall was finished on the 25th day of the month of Elul in 52 days. And this strikes fear into the hearts of the enemies, and we talked a little bit about who those enemies are and how Tobiah had influenced them. Talk about this, you know, the fact that the walls finished, the timing and all that that's recorded there in verses 15 and 16. Yeah, so I got three different commentaries here, and they all give a very balanced view of this, I think. Uh, One commentary said that, well, it shouldn't be that surprising or miraculous that the wall was finished so quickly because all the materials were already there, all the logistics were set up, so of course... You know, everything's laid out and everything's got streamlined, boom, 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 it's done. But at the same time, these, these other two commentaries uh, pointed out this a balance of this. Well, yeah, everything was set up, but anything that would have set, been set up ahead of time was of the Lord. He works yeah. through lots of ways. So, yeah, of course it was finished in 52 days. And just what we see might be, okay, yeah, they already had all the stone and lumber ready to go. Everything was fine. They had all the food and everything they needed. Everything was set. So, of course, it went really fast. But, yeah, God set that up. And so if ever there was a doubt, it should be obvious to the enemies that, oh, yeah, God's behind us. Oh, they never could have done this as quickly as they did. Uh, other, uh, one, uh, another thing I read is, well, maybe the wall wasn't that damaged. Maybe there's only minor repairs. You know what? Maybe, But regardless of the situation, it was of the Lord. He set it up. So this was established from God that it would be done quickly and efficiently, despite all of the things that they, the enemies tried to do. And, you know, I've been talking about the wisdom of leadership and all of these other softer things that we get from Scripture, but also there's that central idea of all of Scripture is about Jesus. And if you read a passage long enough, you're going to find him in there. And I think of, you know, how much did the kingdom of darkness do to prevent Jesus from coming, and yet he came anyways. You you can't argue that was, wasn't was of God. It was just everything was lined up perfect. Yeah. Yeah, this is—we've and we, we've talked about this is one of the ways you see Christ in the book of Nehemiah is, is often the way that the Lord works in history to bring about the fullness of time. And so bringing mm-hmm. about the completion of the wall in 52 days, which is a very quick time to build the walls of Jerusalem— this is the Lord working through history, and it's it's striking not not only Nehemiah and the the returned exiles recognize that reality, but even the enemies realize what's going on. Which this too fits into the pattern that the Lord sets in Holy Scripture, where the think about the Egyptians who are pursuing the the Israelites through the Red Sea. At a certain point, they realize, oh, the Lord is fighting for for them, and we are in trouble. 
the <laughs> enemies of the Lord often recognize this. I don't know that it, it says here in this text that any of them are converted. Uh, we, we have heard at other moments, though, within the books of Daniel, Ezra, and Nehemiah, that there are those who do, do come to trust in the Lord through the faithful witness of the people of God and through what the Lord does in history for them. And so this, again, God be praised for this work that is accomplished in 52 days and the way that it is firmly recognized, this has been the Lord's doing. And that's a, it's a marvelous thing. Yeah, there's got to be, you know, it's, it's not obvious maybe to when you read through it, but it's, it's you got to be. There has to be at least some onesies, twosies of people looking at this thing, huh, maybe I'm on the wrong side. Maybe I got to cross lines and, and head over here. And that's it, like you said. We say that all throughout. Uh, think of the the when they spied out the land before the invasion, and then uh, ah, my brain does this sometimes. Uh, Rahab, yeah, is the Rahab, one that, yes, Rahab yeah. would. She, what she helps them out because she recognizes, yeah, I'm on the wrong side. I want to be on your guys's team. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and again, that's where uh, we've seen this again throughout these same three books: Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah that when the people of God respond faithfully and without compromise to the to the opposition that is where the Lord blesses not only his own people but he blesses the world through his people if Nehemiah goes out to the you know the takes the 30 mile journey out to the outskirts of Jerusalem then i mean yeah maybe he gets a, a slight benefit at the time in a worldly sense but he loses his eternal reward and the people around around them don't get to see what the Lord's up to, and, and don't have this moment. I mean, Daniel, the same way. Ezra, the same way. Over and over again, it's when the people of God respond faithfully without compromise, that despite what earthly you know sight would tell us, the Lord actually blesses his people, and then he blesses the world around his people precisely because they didn't compromise on his truth. Yes, you know, I, I see that um, a lot, too. I, you know, I've been a member of various churches throughout my life and I've attended various churches throughout my life. And I've seen a lot of times you'll, you'll people say, you know, we gotta, I know the Bible says this, but I think we really gotta let this go because if we do, it'll seem more inclusive and maybe we'll get more people in. But those churches usually don't tend to grow anyways. It's usually, and we, we see that post COVID say it's the churches that are, that are faithful, that are confessional, that actually believe something. I know, here, even though we have closed communion in place, and there are some people, they come to my church, and they'll come to worship, they know I'm not going to commune them. There's this one guy in particular, uh, I love him dearly, he's part of the, the Free Bible Church, but he comes once in a while, because he says, you know, I like your preaching, it's pretty interesting. He actually brought his daughter, who was a missionary, she just came back from Africa, and he says, hey, we're going to go to this guy's church this weekend because that guy, he's pretty neat. I think you should have a chat with him. Why does he do it? Because as he says, you actually believe something and you're firm on that. And there's so many people in this world today who aren't. And that's compelling. Well, Nehemiah was firm in his convictions, his desire to do the Lord's work and to build this wall. And it was completed with the Lord's help. And now everyone's looking at that and saying, huh, yeah, there's something going on here. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So the Lord gives success. He is the one who blesses what's going on. Now, as we said earlier, this doesn't end the opposition at this moment in history, but it is a evidence of God's faithfulness to his people, which we continue to see throughout the rest of the book of Nehemiah and in the rest of the scriptures. Pastor Helms, it's been a great conversation. we got about a minute left here on the morning. Help us to wrap things up on, on Nehemiah 6 and the first verses of 7 today. Well, you know, like I said, as somebody in this area, lots of people, they work with organizations that may not be, you know, happy with their convictions. I'd say something I learned from Nehemiah, and again, is it, uh, Ezra and, and Daniel, is that, you know, just because you don't live and work in the community that is kind to your beliefs, you know, stay true to them, follow their examples. The Lord will bless that work. And, you know, seek the good of those above you for the sake of the community you are in. And when those who come and accuse you and say, 
you're in open rebellion, just follow the example of Nehemiah and know that, you know, just you have, that you're doing the right thing, come what may. And know that in this mess, God used this mess to sustain the nation of Israel and through that brought our Messiah. So whatever mess you're in, God can use that. Pastor James Helms Jr. serves at Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Greenbelt, Maryland. He's been helping us today to study Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 1 through chapter 7, verse 4. Pastor Helms, thanks for being our guest today. Thank you. Been a pleasure. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. If you have any questions about Nehemiah 6, send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. It's always a joy to hear from you. Join us tomorrow as we read chapter 7 of Nehemiah. Nehemiah discovers the list of those exiles who returned back when Cyrus made his initial edict. Thanks for spending the morning with us today. Talk to you again tomorrow. Showing support for KFUO is now easier than ever. You can sport a KFUO shirt, swag, or even socks by visiting our online store. Go to kfuo.org slash store and order high-quality KFUO-branded merch. You no longer need to wait for our annual share for a chance to show your KFUO spirit. Visually share and wear this ministry out in the world by checking out our selection. Every purchase helps to support our proclamation of Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Go to kfuo.org slash store.